Welcome back to the Beginner's Guide to the Modern Theory of Polarization, a series of modules to help you understand how the electric polarization is defined, calculated and measured in bulk periodic solids, brought to you by Schrodinger's Kittens Productions. In module one, we reviewed the electric dipole moment of an isolated molecule and concluded that it's a well-defined quantity, at least in the case that the molecule is not charged. In this second module, we'll show that things are not so straightforward for bulk periodic solids, and that in fact the electric polarization, which is the dipole moment per unit volume, can't be uniquely defined. Let's go back to our polar diatomic molecule, but this time make a crystalline lattice by periodically repeating it. For simplicity, we'll stay in one dimension, so our solid is a chain of molecules, each with bond length d. If we put each molecule in a unit cell of length a, say, like this, then we can immediately write down the polarization, which, since we're in one dimension, we'll take to be the dipole moment per unit length instead of the dipole moment per unit volume. And it's equal to Q times D divided by A. So nothing unusual so far. But what if instead of defining the unit cell so that each unit cell contains one of our original molecules, instead we define it like this. This is a completely valid choice because it can be periodically repeated to build up the whole chain, and we've changed nothing about the physical system. The chain still consists of alternating anions and cations with a distance of d between the nearest neighbours. Taking position z is equal to zero to be the left edge of the unit cell, then our cation is at z equals to a half d, and the anion is at z equal to a minus d over 2. So working out the polarization by summing over the charges on the ions times their positions and dividing by the length of the unit cell gives us 1 over a times q times d over 2 minus q times a minus d over 2, which is equal to q times d over a minus q. This is not the same as the value we obtained with the previous choice of unit cell, but it differs from it by Q. And in fact, if we repeated this procedure, choosing different unit cells each time, we would obtain many different values for the polarization, all of which could be written as QD over A plus some negative or positive integer times Q. You can give it a try to convince yourself remembering that your unit cell can include any pair of anions and cations that can be periodically repeated to build up the chain, not necessarily only those that are next to each other. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, I'm afraid that things are going to get worse before they get better. Let's take a look at this one-dimensional crystal lattice in which the anions and the cations are evenly spaced. Both the anions and the cations are centers of inversion. And so by definition, the lattice is nonpolar. But if we work out the dipole moment per unit length, recognizing that the spacing between all pairs of atoms is now A over two, we get that P is equal to one over A times minus A over four times Q plus three over three A over four times Q, which equals Q over two for this unit cell. And P is equal to one over A times plus A over four times Q plus minus three over A over four times Q, which equals minus Q over two for this one. This is different from the first value that we calculated by Q. And again, just as in the case for the polar lattice, if we made many choices of unit cells, we would find that we obtained many answers, 
all differing by integer multiples of q. So what can we conclude? First, that the polarization of a periodic lattice is multi-valued. For our 1D case, we found that p is equal to some value p0 plus n times q, where n is an integer. If we repeated the analysis in three dimensions, we would find that p is equal to p0 plus this quantity here, n times the electronic charge E times the lattice vector R divided by the unit cell volume V. This quantity E times R over V will pop up a lot and so we give it a name. It's called the polarization quantum PQ. The second thing that we can conclude is that the polarization of a nonpolar lattice does not have to be zero. In fact, we found that for the nonpolar lattice we considered, the polarization was q over 2 plus some integer times q. And if we repeated our analysis for the nonpolar lattice in three dimensions, we would obtain polarization values equal to pq over 2 plus n times the polarization quantum. This leads us to our first exercise for this module. Using the formula p is equal to q over 2 plus n times q for our nonpolar 1D chain, or if you prefer, you can take the 3D case, p is equal to pq over 2 plus n times pq, make a list of a few polarization values for successive values of positive and negative n. We call this list the polarization lattice. You should notice something about the symmetry of the list. And so that you don't have to stay in suspense until the next module, your second exercise is to choose any unit cell and calculate the difference in polarizations between the polar and the nonpolar lattices. Then choose another unit cell and do the same. You should notice something that might, might make you feel less alarmed. When you're happy with your answers, come back and join us for module three in the series when we'll look in more detail at this strange polarization quantum to understand why it exists and what it means. Thanks for listening.